I'll be honest with me here for a second. How many of you guys started a machine learning project, then thought, wait, what model am I supposed to use again? Or better yet, you started implementing something only to realize 30 minutes in, oh, this is completely wrong. I know I've experienced this too many times to count. So I decided to fix that. I spent days making a machine learning cheat sheet that you and I can use to reduce the decision fatigue when it comes to deciding what models to use and when. Now, before you get too excited, let me make a couple things clear. This is not designed to teach you machine learning. The expectation here is that you already have a foundation in machine learning, but this will help you make your decisions much faster. The second thing is this isn't comprehensive. This is an iterative process, and I plan to add more to the sheet as I learn more, and you guys can help with that too. So now on to the question that you're probably thinking about, how do I use it? All right, so for those of you who don't know me, welcome. My name is Ranesh and I'm a data scientist currently working at a tech startup. And just like I do in my job, I often face scenarios where I have to think of what kind of models I need to use for the best chance of success. It usually starts off with a problem statement, a business case, or even a scenario. And then I have to think from there, what kind of models or workflow can I follow to achieve this goal? So I thought for this video, the best way to demonstrate how this cheat sheet works is to go through a couple scenarios myself. All right, so as you can see here, I have the mirror board pulled up and don't worry, you guys will get access to a PDF if you want or some sort of link to download this cheat sheet and you can print it out or use the digital version like I will. Uh, and essentially I have three scenarios up here, a regression problem, a classification problem, and a clustering problem. Uh, and that will demonstrate the extent or the capabilities of the sheet sheet. I tried to keep it high level so we don't go too much into deep learning and we don't include a lot of complex models just because I figured this is V1 and we can iterate on it later on. In the mirror board, I have a lot of visuals to describe uh, specific definitions and terms and what they mean. And I'll try to include all this in the physical cheat sheet that you guys can access. So let's start off with scenario number one. Let's say we are working as a data scientist for a real estate agency or a real estate company and they want us to predict house prices based on features like you know square footage, number of bedrooms, maybe bathrooms, uh, location, and year built or age. Uh, so yeah, we have to pr predict the price. And to me, that clearly tells us that this is a regression problem. It could also be seen as a classification problem if you wanna classify each price group as like high, medium, and low. However, for this scenario, we're gonna use a data set with a continuous output or target variable. All right, now to the fun part, the cheat sheet itself. We start off at the top where we define the problem. And here, I know it's kind of stretched out, but don't worry, in the cheat sheet, it'll be much more compressed and easier to view. Uh, essentially here, we're trying to understand if it's a supervised or unsupervised problem. And for those of you who don't know, supervised essentially means uh, the data is labeled, meaning you have true, false, or it has an output, like a continuous output. And then for unsupervised, we don't really have a label for the target variable. So we're trying to come up with that label uh, through this machine learning model. So like I said before, we know that this is a supervised problem because we have labeled data, the price column. Uh, however, we do need to figure out if this is a continuous data set or if it's categorical. And just by the data set itself, the price column, which is the column we're trying to predict, is continuous. It's numerical inputs, it's increasing, there's no cap, it's not discrete. So we can go ahead and follow the branch down to the continuous section. All right, so now that we know it's a regression problem because it's a continuous data set, we can then go to the next step or the next question in the branch of the tree, which is, is this a linear relationship or is this a non-linear relationship? And for those of you who don't know what this means, a linear relationship just means the target variable correlated with other variables. Does it come up with a linear graph or is it a linear pattern? or is it non-linear? And the way you can find this is by doing simple scatter plots with your target variable and other uh, you know, features that you're using. So like I said, since we're assuming linear relationship for this specific data set, we can then go to the next question, which is are missing values present or are missing values absent? Uh, and just because I know the data set, there's no missing values in this data set specifically, uh, but I'll go through both cases just to give you some explanations of how you can deal with missing values. So let's say they are missing values. You can go ahead and impute the data if it's needed uh, through methods like mode, median, mean, or KNN imputation, or you could remove those records entirely if you deem fit. But you obviously need to have some sort of domain knowledge or business expertise because there can be cases where you know, the data should be null, the data should be missing. Uh, maybe if like for this housing data set, let's say there's a bathroom or garage column, number of garage or parking spots, and that number is null. That could mean there's no parking spot. So then we would do a zero imputation. However, there might be other cases where the, the null value represents something else. So you'd have to understand your data set. You have to understand your problem and the business case. But there are definitely some cases where you might need to do an imputation. Maybe it's mean, mode, median, KNN, like I said before. Uh, and then those are the cases that I would recommend trying out or understanding your data better just to see what would, would be the best case to impute that data. Maybe you could use mean or median, or maybe you can use a KNN to 
uh, come up with a result that, that is better suited for the skewness of your data set, the distribution and stuff like that. So now that we know our data set does not have any missing values, we can go to the next question, which is, is multicollinearity present or is it absent? And for those of you who don't know, multicollinearity just means a correlation between multiple features in the data set. So let's say you have number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms in your data set. And let's just say those two features are highly correlated. Then you would have a graph like this, uh, which shows strong positive correlation. And if that's the case, you might want to consider uh, feature selection and you can do this by doing like correlation matrices or dimensionality reduction through like uh, VIF or PCA or stuff like that. You can even use specific regression methods like L1 or L2 uh, just because this is a regression model. However, there are also cases where you might want to keep that feature uh, if you deem that it's necessary for the model to compute. This specific data set, we're going to assume that there's no multicollinearity. So your graph would look something like this between you know other features, maybe feature A and feature B, feature C and feature D, or just plot a correlation matrix and see if the correlation between all the uh, independent features are you know low, just to confirm. So yeah, let's just say there's no multicollinearity in your data uh, for this specific scenario at least. Then we can move on to the next set of questions, which is, are there outliers in your data? And you could do this a very, you can you could identify this uh, at a number of ways. You can just do a scatter plot like I did here. You can do you know a skewness or a box plot and stuff like that just to identify if there's outliers. And if there is outliers, you can use a couple other methods like a robust regression method or a tree-based model like a decision tree, XG boost or random forest to kind of reduce the risk of these outliers impacting your output or your you know, model's uh, prediction. So if there are outliers in your data set, you can consider using stuff like a robust regression model, a tree-based model like a decision tree, random forest, XG boost, or maybe if those outliers should not be included in your model prediction, maybe let's say you're working with a company and they have like a contract with you and you shouldn't include that in your analysis because it's not part of your, uh, I guess, sample, then you should maybe exclude those records from your entire data set for this model prediction. And then once you don't have outliers in your data set, you can then go ahead and decide if interpretation is important for this specific model. Do you need to be able to explain, you know, why it's working, how it's working and stuff like that? If that's the case, then I would consider just using a simple linear regression model if that, uh, you know, if it, if it works for your data set. If not, then you can try and use something more complex like neural nets, which I highly recommend staying away from unless you need to. Uh, maybe focus on more tree-based models like decision trees, XG boost, random forests, and stuff like that, like I said before, just because neural nets can be pretty hard to explain. Uh, next, let's go on to scenario two, which is a classification problem. It's about spam. So in this scenario, we're talking about spam emails. Let's say you're working for a company and they want you to build a spam email classifier uh, that labels emails as spam or not spam based on features like uh, sender address, text content, uh, frequency of certain words, characters, and stuff like that. Uh, and with this information, we know now that this is a binary classification problem just because we know there's only two predicted or two labels, which is spam or not spam, and these are categorical, they're not continuous. So if you go back to our cheat sheet over here, we know this is a supervised problem. We also know it's categorical. It's a classification problem just because we know the uh, labels or the target output is spam or not spam or true or false for a spam. So now that we know it's a classification problem, we can then go on to the next step or next question in our decision tree or our uh, cheat sheet, which is, is this a binary target variable or is it multi-class? And for our case, it is binary, it's true, false, it's spam or not spam, but there are cases where it's ABC, maybe high, medium, low, stuff like that. So do take that into consideration. From there, we want to know if the data set is balanced or imbalanced. And by this, I mean if the target variable is equally balanced or very imbalanced. There are cases where maybe the true values or the spam values are like 20% in your trading or your sample data set uh, and the you know, not spam values are 80%, 75%, stuff like that. And in those cases, you want to consider using oversampling techniques like SMOTE or undersampling techniques or just using tree-based models like I frequently use uh, because you can adjust the class weights and like an XG boost or random forest pretty easily. However, if the data set is not imbalanced and you have a pretty even 50-50 split, then you can consider if there's multicollinearity, like I explained before, if there's correlation between two or more uh, independent features. And if there is multicollinearity, then you probably want to perform some sort of feature selection process, whether it be a correlation matrix, a VIF, PCA, something like that. Or if you're planning to use a tree-based model, which you can, then you're going to be fine because tree-based models tend to handle multicollinearity pretty well. So let's just assume for the sake of this scenario, there's not really any multicollinearity present. Then we can go on to the next branch, which is, do you want a probability estimate? And by this, I mean, instead of just a true false output, do you want a probability score, maybe like 79% or 0.79 uh, instead of a true? Uh, or a 0.21 instead of a false. And if that's the case, you might want to choose a logistic regression model or naive Bayes model, XGBoost with softmax or something similar. 
And these probability estimates can be pretty handy, especially if you're using this model to leverage some sort of other algorithm running in your app, if you're productionizing it or something like that. I've used probability estimates in the past to rank specific scenarios just so we can operate faster. And you know, just having a probability score, it's much more dynamic compared to just true false for specific scenarios or situations. So that's pretty neat too. And you can also, uh, I think usually adjust the thresholds of these true false bind, uh, like boundaries for probability. So let's say instead of at 50 or 0.5, you can adjust it to like 0.3 or 0.6, uh, just to improve your accuracy and stuff like that. So I know for this specific scenario, we don't need a probability estimate because they only want to know if the data is spam or not spam with a label. Uh, the next question from here would be, do you need to interpret the model? And if interpretation is required, consider a logistic regression model, decision tree, random forest, or XGBoost. A simple logistic regression model is actually one of my favorite models to use for classification problems, uh, just because you know I've used it a lot of times and it's pretty, it's been pretty successful for me so far. Uh, and I, I've had you know experience explaining it and also using it, implementing it, and productionizing it. So. That's pretty neat. If let's say interpretation is not really required, then you can go ahead and use something like a neural net. However, like I said before, I don't recommend using neural nets unless you really have to, just because it's pretty hard to explain a black box like a neural net to someone uh, uh, who's not in technical and also just understanding what's happening and customizing it uh, just for a small percent or small lift in you know, accuracy and stuff like that. To me, it's just not that worth it unless it really, really is needed. Also, you probably noticed that a lot of the models, especially the tree-based models like XGBoost, Decision Trees, Random Forest, can uh, be used for various different situations and that's just because they're diverse and versatile. However, there are strengths and weaknesses uh, of when to use them and how to use them and I'll explain that in part two. You'll also probably notice visuals like this where I kind of try to explain for those of you who aren't familiar uh, what a Decision Tree is versus you know something like a Random Forest or an XGBoost. Uh, the difference between bagging and boosting it's a big topic however the simplified version is this one runs in parallel so it's independent and this one runs dependently so it goes sequentially and you need to wait for the first tree to run then the second tree can run and then the third and so on and so forth all right let's move on to scenario three so let's say in scenario three a retail store contracts you out to group customers into different segments based on their shopping behavior using features like you know uh, purchase frequency, amount spent, product, categories, and stuff like that. Keywords like group, cluster, segment tend to always relate to unsupervised learning or unsupervised machine learning. In this case, it'll be clustering. And as you can see the data set here, there are a couple good features. They're all numerical. They're all seemingly continuous. So yeah, let's go on to the other side of the cheat sheet where we can focus on the unsupervised section of this cheat sheet. So now the first question we really want to know is, is there a high dimensionality in the data? Uh, what this means is, is there a lot of features in your data set? Maybe there's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, or maybe there's just five. Uh, in which case, if there is too many features in your data set, you might want to check if a lot of these features are redundant. Maybe you have price and also average order value. They might be highly correlated. So you want to consider some sort of dimensionality reduction, maybe PCA. Uh, VIF, something to reduce the number of features that you're feeding into your clustering model. And once you do reduce your dimensionality or the number of features, you can then focus on the number of clusters. Do you know the number of clusters you want or is this unexpected? For example, maybe you know that you only want small, medium, and large or uh, low spending, medi medium spending, and high spending customers. So those are three clusters. Or maybe you just want it to be dynamic and you don't really know how many clusters you want to split this up into. Let's say for this scenario, you know you only want to split it up to three clusters. Then you can consider something like K-means clustering. It's pretty basic. It uses centroids to group or segment customers or you know your data. And it's a pretty well-used clustering model. You don't know the number of clusters you need there are a couple of models that you can still use, but first you need to know if your data set is linearly separable or not. So now you might be asking, what does linearly separable mean? Well, I have a couple of charts in this data set that kind of show you what linear separation looks like. So you can use that and determine if your specific scenario, your specific data set is linearly separable or not. For this scenario, let's just assume that it isn't. If it isn't, then you can consider something like a DB scan or GMM. Uh, which tend to work pretty well for these kinds of situations. So if it is linearly separable, you can then go ahead and ask the next question, which is, are there outliers in my data? And for most cases, there probably is gonna be outliers, but it doesn't hurt to check. So go ahead and plot a box plot or something like that, just to visualize how your data looks like. And if you do use a scatter plot, you're gonna notice something like this, where you can tell there are clearly outliers, uh, you know, points that don't really follow the trend. Uh, versus something like this where it's pretty clean, there's no real outliers here, everything looks uh, like along a specific line, a trend line. So let's just say there are outliers and you can't exclude them because you need to include them for the specific analysis. Then I would recommend considering something like a DB scan. 
And if there aren't any outliers, then I recommend using something like a GMM. Personally, I love GMMs. They haven't really failed me in the past and they're pretty easy to use. So hopefully that was helpful. That was essentially part of one of the cheat sheet. There's also gonna be a big chunk of it where I explain specific strengths, weaknesses, you know, assumptions and stuff like that for each machine learning model. And I group them by, you know, their uh, supervised and unsupervised or classification, regression versus clustering. Uh, and in this case, you can see linear regression. They have a couple of strengths, couple of weaknesses and the assumptions you need versus something like an XG boost uh, and also maybe a DB scan for clustering. I personally would recommend using this just to understand what your model needs to perform well, just because if you implement it and you don't really have the data it needs to succeed, then you're just gonna be wasting your time. You know, in data science and machine learning, garbage in is garbage out. So data quality and just understanding what you're using and how it works is very important. Some of the stuff that I mentioned before, like for example, for a logistic regression, uh, it assumes linear decision boundaries or for a decision tree, it can handle class imbalances. Uh, just look this over if you're going to implement a specific model just to understand how it works. Reuse this for your free time just to better understand how specific machine learning models uh, work and you know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are too. Also going back to this cheat sheet, I do know that for a lot of the final models, there's a couple recommendations like logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, XG boost and stuff like that. And for the most part, you'll kind of understand what model to use based on experience. For example, if you have a specific problem that you face multiple times, then maybe, you know, XG boost is the best model for that. However, if you're new to this or if you haven't really had much experience, then I recommend trying multiple models. Maybe you try all the models, logistic regression, decision tree, random forest and XG boost, or maybe you just try XG boost and random forest. It's up to you. Unless this is a production environment, or you're working with really big data sets uh, or there's costs associated to it, there really shouldn't be any harm with trying more than one model. In fact, oftentimes I do model selection with a couple models, different types of models in fact, just to determine what performs better and then I go into hyper tuning and optimization uh, and experiments and stuff like that. So don't be afraid to mix around and try a couple models just to understand you know, what model overfits here, what model underfits here and stuff like that. If you don't really know what overfitting and underfitting means, uh, then you might wanna go get a refresher in machine learning just because those are very important concepts that you will need to understand uh, to make sure your model generalizes uh, and works in the real world. <laughs> Anyway, that's about it for this video. I noticed that the hardest part for most machine learning or data science projects is usually getting started. So my hope for you guys is hopefully this sheet sheet can help you guys break that decision fatigue or that you know wall that's preventing you guys from getting started on your own individual machine learning or data science projects or projects that you have for work and you know get started much quicker. The best advice I can give you guys is to break things, fail quicker, fail faster, to learn more and experiment here and there, just because this will obviously help you learn. I personally believe the differences between people who succeed and people who don't is the number of failures or experiments they're willing to go through. The cheat sheet will be available for completely free down in the description box below and also in the pinned comments too. Also, like I said in the beginning of this video, this is not comprehensive. There are gonna be mistakes. There are gonna be things that can be improved, things that can be added on. So do let me know your thoughts and maybe your advice down below. If you guys are new here and like this kind of content, do consider subscribing because there's gonna be a lot more where this came from. As always, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.